Now rewind me because there's a lot of people way at the back. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I will try to project my voice as much as possible. And welcome, this is going to be my second talk on this subject. I don't know how many of you were here last term, but I also did a talk on Vinicrow's Mean Valley Theorem. One person in the back, let's go. Another person, three, awesome. Uh, I think there's a recording of that somewhere, so if you're curious about what I talked about there, then you can go watch that afterwards. Uh, I don't know if it's very good, though. I know there were some problems with that. But I'm going to basically skip over all of the details that I gave that time, and I'm going to jump into actually trying to talk about this specific system over here, which is this monster. So I study number theory. Number theory is amazing. It's really hard, though, and we ask really kind of boring questions that no one really cares about such as this one. Let's say I have this system of equations where I have two s variables and k equations where I'm kind of running through all these powers, and I want to know how many integer solutions there are to this. But because, you know, we want to actually try to get like a bound on the size, we need to impose a bound on the size of each variable here. So we bound them by some capital X, and just think of that as some really big number. All right, so we have this system, and what I did in the talk before was I tried to write this system in a really cool way using some kind of neat ideas from number theory, and I ended up writing it as this integral here. Uh, you can show this using what we call the orthogonality relationship. Again, details that I'm going to skip because we're going to move on to actually talk about how to tackle this piece. But basically, you can write out this exponential sum here, integrate over it, and this actually counts the number of solutions to this equation. And then once we have this integral here, you can apply lots of cool analysis sort of tricks to get some good bounds on it. And in doing so, a bound for the lower part of this pops up, which is x to the s plus x to the 2s minus k times k minus 1 divided by 2. When you're in number theory, what you always do is you find your best lower bound, and then you just assume that's the upper bound as well. And then you try to prove that, and hopefully you're right. And that's exactly what this guy Vinogradov did. He studied the system, he got this lower bound, and he said, this is actually the upper bound as well, up to some epsilon error term here. So this is what we call Vinogradov's mean value theorem. He studied this in like the 1930s or something, and no one was able to solve this actually, uh, except for two cases, kind of the easy ones. If you have k is equal to one, then you just have a linear equation. I think everyone here can probably solve that, otherwise, you might want to refund on your degree. <laughs> and the other one that you could solve with a bit of work was k equals 2, because you're dealing with some quadratic stuff. And if you take in some number theory courses, then there's lots of cool techniques for solving quadratic solutions. But what do you do for these harder ones when you get to very large values of k, or even k equals 3? No one knew what to do for the longest time until this guy, Trevor Woolley, adapted this really cool technique that I'm going to kind of talk about a little bit at a very high level. His actual paper for this is like 70 pages long, so I'm going to skip so many details, but I'm going to try to give you just like a rough idea of what he was doing. So very first thing, let's take a look at this bound here. And you'll notice something kind of interesting happens as we change the value of x. Say you fixed k, and now we're ranging over the values of x. Notice that these two actually sort of swap as the dominating term, depending on what s is. And they do it specifically at this point here. s equals k times k minus 1 divided by 2. When s is less than this, I think this one dominates. And then when it's larger, this one dominates. So it's kind of this critical strip that once you cross, you change the dominating term. Now, this is going to be very useful for us because you can actually show that it suffices to prove this result specifically in this case to actually prove the entire conjecture. Uh, and I'll do the details for that very quickly. They require a little bit of analysis, so if you know what Holder's inequality is, then this will make sense to you. If you don't, then don't worry about it. So what you basically do is we have this integral here, and you're going to break it up into two cases. The first case is where you say that s is less than k times k minus 1 divided by 2. If that happens, then what you can actually do is sort of pull out some of the terms here uh, using just holders and equality. So what you're going to do with that integral I wrote over there is just say that this integral f k alpha to 2s is actually less than or equal to, I think would be this, 
SK, alpha, then you would have like a K times K minus one here, like that, and then you'd have like two S divided by K times K minus one. This is by Holder's inequality. If you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. I'm just pulling this out of my ass. <laughs> and then if you actually have the result, as I said, for this specific value here, you'll notice that the exponent popping up here corresponds to that. And so you can use the bound that you would get from it to get something like this, x to the k times k minus 1, so the 2s here, x to the 5 by 2, like that. And then this all just cancels away, and you're just left with an x to the s. And look, that's the upper bound that you would have there, so you're good. In the other case, when s is larger than k times k minus 1, all you're going to do is just kind of like pull out some of the variables here as follows. So we have this bad boy, and this is just going to become this. I'm going to pull out k times k minus 1 of these and leave the rest inside. So I have this actually times k times k minus 1, the alpha. And again, just using the bound, assuming you have the case for s equals k times k minus 1 divided by 2, then this is just big O. Oh yeah, and I guess I should say, if you're not familiar with number theory notation, this just means big O. You've covered that probably in like CS something, whatever. <laughs> I don't know courses. I'm just very old now. This is like my last term, so I forget where everything was taught, but you would have learned that at some point. So then if you use that, then you end up with these things just becoming uh, an x to the k times k minus 1 again. What about 2? Right. Yes. And then that would just become this. And look at that. That's the term that we were looking at before. So it suffices to just do it in this one case. Now, how the hell do you do that one case? Not an easy question to answer because we're dealing with some equations here. Equations that aren't linear or quadratic are like really hard to solve, and especially when you have lots of them happening at once, just like no dice whatsoever. So here's the idea that people came up with. You try to cozy on up to this system of equations, take it out to a nice dinner, get it to tell us all its secrets, but it refuses. So then it does what all the girls in my life did, and they go after its brother. <laughs> <laughs> Modulo a prime. Turn your system of equations into a system of congruences. This gives us a little bit extra firepower now because congruences are a little bit easier to work with in general. And here's the clever trick we can do. If we pick P to be really, really large, so that say this happens, this is actually the same thing. Because now all we've done is said, we're working with a system of congruences, but all the solutions still have to be less than or equal to x, so they're really just equations modulo p, but they're kind of not, if that makes any sense. And what you're actually going to do, for technical reasons, is not just work modulo p, but do it to a prime power that's very, very large. Does that make sense to everyone? When you're dealing with equations, turn them in con into congruences because they're easier to work with. Okay, how do we actually do that then? That? Well, I can always just write it this way, but then where do I go from there? Again, it's not entirely clear how I solve this system of congruences, but I just get the feeling that it'll be easier to work with than systems of equations. So now what we're gonna wanna do is follow our nose as number theorists and try to break these things into arithmetic progressions, basically. We're going to force specific constraints multiple times repeatedly along this to try and constrain the system until we get to something that we can look at and say, yes, I know what the solutions are, and they have this number. Cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put out some notation. I'm not going to define it formally by any means because that would take way too long. But because we're just doing conceptual stuff, this will be fine. So for my system of congruences, I'm going to denote it by this. So I'm just going to put this symbol here to say it's the system of congruences. So that's our number here, where we're doing this modulo p to the power of b. p gets picked at a certain point in this very technical argument, 
I won't go through the details there, but you can just think of this prime as being fixed. We picked it very appropriately, so now we're okay. And now what we're gonna wanna do is try to constrain them in a certain way. So what I'm gonna do is basically break them as follows. I'm gonna define this new thing, call it USK V of H, where what I'm gonna say now is that for all of the solutions in this system, the vectors are going to have to satisfy some sort of constraint. I'm gonna make them congruent to some Z modulo P to the H. Again, H is a number that gets picked in this argument. Don't worry about what it is. This may be a little bit low for people. Do people see this? Yes, I see some thumbs. Okay, cool. So this is what my USK VH is going to be. <clears throat> Just think of it as I'm imposing a congruence relationship on the solution here. And now the natural question to ask is, how are these two things related? <clears throat> Let's find out. And by let's find out, I mean I'm going to tell you because I don't have time to do the proof. <laughs> They're related as follows. USK B big O of this bad boy. So what does this really say? Don't think of this as symbols. Think of this as just the solutions to these equations here. What I've done is I've taken a system that doesn't have constraints on the variables, modulo p to the h, and I've forced constraints on them, modulo p to the h. In doing that, I had to pay a price of p to the h for every two variables that I had there. And this isn't actually that hard to show. What you can do is sort of follow along what we did here of writing this as an integral. You can do the same thing for these congruence uh, counting arguments. And then you can again do like holder inequality stuff to them. And this actually comes out in the wash like really easily. But just intuitively, we should kind of expect this. Each variable, I just pay the price of P to the H. Okay, so we have this bound, but is it the best bound? I don't know. Let's give a name to what the best bound can be and try to see if we can actually work with it a little bit. So I'm gonna define this value. Lambda S of K to be, I'll just say the inf of, eh, how long is it note this? You actually write this as like four lim inf stuff, so I'm not gonna write that all out, but just think of it as the smallest value for raising P to the H here, such that this is still true. So just replace this P S to the H, or this P, the S H with a P epsilon H, and then find out what the uh, smallest value of epsilon is. Okay, well, as it turns out, we can look at a very specific value for this. I said there's that critical line in the system where S equals K times K minus one divided by two. Let's investigate a little bit. Let's see what happens when we're dealing with that specific instance. When that happens, we actually have that this is equal to zero. Ooh, let that settle in for a little bit. And that's going to be the bulk of this argument here. There's still tons of steps you need to do after this, but it basically means that you can replace this S with like any epsilon here that you want any positive epsilon. And then from there, you can run a bunch of technical arguments to actually relate this back to Vinogradov's original system, and then you're done. The bulk of the argument is to show this bad boy. How do we go about doing that? Well, our classic argument in math is a contradiction. So let's assume this isn't true. Assume that this is greater than zero. What I'm going to do now is I have a, a system of congruences that have some certain constraints to them, and I'm going to keep applying more and more constraints. You can show through some technical work that as long as this value is greater than zero, meaning it's positive, you can repeatedly apply this sort of constraint onto your system. And in doing so, we're going to just apply it so many times that we actually uh, violate a trivial bound on this, specifically the one when I had 
That looks weird now. Ah, well, let's put a circle there. Yay. <laughs> okay. All right. Everyone with me so far? Okay. This unconstrained system, you put a constraint on it, but we did this to every single one of the variables, which isn't really flexible. I'm saying that every single one has to be congruent to the same thing module P to DH. But what if I want some solutions that have some congruences for say like the first R variables and then a different one for the remaining S minus R ones. That's what we're going to be investigating a little bit here. Hmm. I guess I'll write it over here again. We introduce now the constrained system. And I tried to like make mnemonic devices that make this make sense. I always thought of like U as being unconstrained. But then the problem is like this has a constraint on this. So the way I'm going to explain this one, which I denote by K, is it's contrasting constraints. Nice little tongue twister for you. Try to say that three times fast afterwards. Basically, I'm going to say that some of the variables have to satisfy a specific constraint, and the other ones have to satisfy a different constraint. Yeah, that ends up being this in itself. This is going to be where I say have the first r, I think it's like r times r minus 1 divided by 2 variables satisfy this first constraint. We'll just write it like this. And that's actually pretty hexy to me sometimes. Yeah, I'll just write this. You don't even know what I'm talking about, so I can write anything up here. <laughs> So the first r times r minus 1 divided by 2 satisfy this first constraint. And then the rest of them are going to satisfy this other constraint, where I guess I'll just do like mu or something. Wait, no, that's eta. I forget all my symbols. It's been a while. Yeah, that's eta, right? Can someone confirm? OK, very good. My mom and dad would be so proud. <laughs> and we're going to do this for the rest of the variables here. I'm not writing anything technically. I can do whatever I want. I have all the power. <laughs> so then we have a contrasting constraint system. How does it relate to the first constrained one? Well, it relates as follows. I have that USK EH is big O of, yeah, I'm going to have my notes for this. Oh my god, there it is. Okay. Oh, it's right now. Okay. Cool. So you have a P to the S theta and K1 theta theta. I didn't really explain what like the A B mean down there, but it's basically the power that you have your prime to. So it's like P to the A and then P to the B for the congruence. So this is just like P to the theta for both of the congruences. So that's the first thing we do. Again, let's think of this in terms of just the system there. I have my unconstrained system. I'm imposing constraints such that two, the first two variables, I guess, where's up even zero? How does math work? The first, however many variables satisfy the same constraint, and all the remaining ones satisfy a different constraint. And I guess I should have said that z and eta are distinct there. They're not equal. And now what happens? How do we keep going now? We want to iterate this, so let's investigate how we can actually continue doing uh, some constraints on our constraint system already. And the result you get is this one. And I'm not going to, I guess I can. If we want to apply a new constraint to our system, we end up with this. And these brackets here just mean that I'm normalizing the size of this. So you divide by some sort of correction factor for it. Technical stuff. It's really great doing talks like this where I can just brush everything under the rug as technical stuff and I don't have to go into any of the detail. So this normalized value for it satisfies this bound. K times this. Now, that's our lambda that popped up there, our special infimum value that we're looking for and trying to show is equal to zero. 
I have an A prime, B prime, R prime. Those are just like specifically chosen values to make this work. And the important thing to note is that these uh, selections are going to satisfy the hypotheses of this result. So I can again apply this bound again and again and again. So basically, you use this to jumpstart our system here. I'm going to apply my first congruence relationship, apply this constraint, and now I'm just going to iteratively do this over and over and over again. And you can build an infinite sequence of this. And what you end up showing here is that What you end up getting here is just that this lambda sk based off of like the trivial bound that we had before of like the s to the h satisfies this thing. Which is nonsense because we are assuming towards a contradiction this is positive. I divide it by two and it's like larger. What? That doesn't make any sense. So then you get a contradiction. One thing I'll say in the paper that Woolley actually wrote for this, he did this in a more general form, where not just studying this system, but uh, sort of sufficiently independent systems of equations. Uh, what that actually means is that the Vronskyan is non-vanishing. If you don't know what any of that means, then don't worry about it. And you can actually attach weight values onto these two, so that uh, certain solutions have different weights. You just end up having to like correct for them differently along the way and like these normalized weight values here. Not super important, but you can actually generalize this to other situations. And then after a lot of hard work, you can then relate this back to the original system, like I said, by picking P to be a good prime, picking B to be large enough so that the bound is already just true, so solutions, the congruence correspond to solutions of the equations, and then you're done. Cool. I think that's all I have to say for this. I have about three minutes left. So are there any questions? Then I can plug stuff also, because uh, some people probably saw in the Discord that there's a math grad ball coming up. I'm one of the organizers for it. You should all totally come to that. Uh, if you need a date, I will be your date. I already have three of them, so don't worry, join the party. <laughs> Uh, in the price that you pay for constraining that system, you're hiding a constant. Well, what's what's the constant dependent on? Oh, that's a really good question. So for like this original one? Yeah, that one. Uh, that's, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'd have to look back at the paper. But at I the very it least, it's not S and it's not H, right? Pardon? At the very least, it's not dependent yes. on S or H. Yeah, definitely not. And the other thing too is that like, uh, a lot of these values get fixed along the way. So like I said, H gets picked specifically at the beginning depending on like given values. I think it just mostly depends on K. I think that's the only one that truly matters here. But it's all technical stuff that I'm brushing under the rug. Good question. Any other questions? Very good then. Thank you very much.